Hello, YouTube. I'm just setting up for TikTok here. Okay. Oh, all done. Okay. Um, just waiting for people to turn up. Um, usually wait till I get about 100 people. Uh, that's on TikTok here. So. Hello, Noah. Uh, I know that name, Noah Livingston. Seen it before. So are you a regular here? Um, I don't know why I'm always quiet when I start. <laughs> I get louder and louder and louder as I go along. Anyway, while we're waiting, I'd love to know where you're from and what are the ages of your children? I'm here in Vancouver, Canada. My kids are 33 and 28. So what about you? Where are you from and how old are your kids? So where are you from and how old are your children? Oh, sugar. Hmm. It says I'm running too many apps. If I crash, I don't, it's because I'm running too many apps, but I'm not running any other apps. Am I? No, I don't think I am. Anyway. Okay. Ontario, eight months old. Okay. So you've just brand new. Brand new to parenting. Babies are adorable. So eight months crawling, could be walking, would be a really early walker. So I keep getting a notice here telling me that I'm running too many apps. I'm not running any other apps. So yeah. I don't know what's going on there. Anyway, if it shuts down, sorry about that. I'll just shut the whole thing down if it's a problem. Uh, yeah, LOL. Uh, Scotland, 19 months. So you're in the toddler phase. That's my least favorite age. Cute as a button. They're all feet, no brains though. It's cons, oh, sugar. Okay, sorry, it says I'm running too many apps. I don't know, I'm not running any other apps, so. Ah, technology, okay. I'm decent at technology, but my brain just, it, it's always slower with all that stuff. Okay, so where are you from and how old are your children? That's what I'm asking today. Oh, any tips for not crawling? Why would you want to rush that stuff? Parents who have subsequent children are always thrilled when they're not crawling, walking, or talking yet. So <laughs> unless you're really worried, uh, worried. I'm actually loving this age. What, was that the 19 months? Yeah, I, I liked it. I loved it when I was home because my, my home was childproof. It was taking them out because I was out every single day with them. It was taking them out. I used to worry about them all the time when I was out. Um, especially my daughter. She had long blonde, like unusually long blonde hair, and she was really pretty and got a lot of looks, and it gave me the creeps. So I hung on to her like you wouldn't. I mean, my son was adorable too, but she with that long blonde hair, she I I got some real weird looks from creeps at her. And I I, I remember I had other friends who had really like stunning little girls, and they said the same thing. So yeah, I do have a story about a creep who. Uh, <laughs> who tried to touch one of my kids once. Uh, I was right there and stopped it. But anyway, I tell that story quite often on here. But. Okay, um, two years old. So I'm just asking, Germany, hi Germany. I was there for Oktoberfest in 1980. I love Germany. That was still when it was the East and the, and the West. And um, I was gonna say North and South, <laughs> caught myself. But I won't go into the story, but we were going to visit East Germany. But uh, what they did to the bus, they covered the bus up before they entered East Germany. And it scared the bejeebies out of us. So we never did it. Um, that's all different now, of course. It was very intimidating. Okay, so let's get going. I've been on here now for probably two minutes, just rambling on about nothing. So let's get going. I'm a parenting coach. My name is Lisa. And if you go in the link above, it has everything I've got to offer there. You can hire me for coaching, buy one of my courses, or download my free behavior board. You're on that too. That's what makes it work. So don't know why I said it like that. Okay, so your parenting questions. Um, I'm also, I film these on YouTube also. So that's where they're kept. Here on TikTok, I don't know what's going on anywhere really, but they are actually saved on YouTube. So if you're interested, if I answer a question or you have to go before I answer your question, and I, you know. Uh, it'll be on there from Trinidad and Tobago. I have two boys, 10 and eight, Tobago. I'm sure I said that wrong, didn't I? Tobago? Wouldn't be Tobago, no, Tobago. Anyway, Trinidad, I know how to say that. Uh, 10 and eight, that's a nice age. 
They're right between the toddler and the teenage. Okay, so what are your parenting questions? I'll just wait here. Um, I did uh, I did three videos. I'm doing three videos every day lately. The last ones I did yesterday were parent. Did I? Yeah. Parents arguing over your parenting style. So you disagree on how to parent and then stop trying to avoid tantrum scenes, etc. Absolutely. You never try to avoid them. Like bring them on. There are opportunities to exercise your leadership and then focus on the good kid. You want to deal. You want to manage and deal with bad behavior, but make it quick, like pulling up a Band-Aid right back to focusing on the good kid because where you put your focus where you put your energy is what grows so don't focus on all the bad stuff that's another reason why i hate all those mini therapy sessions discussing the bad behavior it's just focusing on it it's dragging through the mud it's just you know salt in the wound i hate that stuff okay toddler screeching every time he wants something he can't have any tips on how to just ignore it they only do what works they'll lean into what works and, and lean away from what doesn't but yeah they're gonna go through all sorts of stuff toddlers are crazy they don't make any sense. Don't try and make sense out of them. I'll actually read you my um, my top five tips for it. Oh, I don't have that up right now. Just let me get it. My, my five top tips for parenting toddlers. I find that really hard to say. I got to come up with something better than that. Okay, social media. Just a sec. I'm in my Trello board here getting up my top five top toddler tips. Number one is childproof your home so you never have to say no. Number two is have a toy rotation system. Number three is connect with them in their world. You don't connect with a three-year-old at the nail salon. You connect with them at the park rolling down the hill. It's always in their world. Number four is don't try and figure them out. This was the one that's for you. Don't try and figure them out. They're not figure outable. They haven't formed yet. Smearing poop on the wall might be completely normal to a toddler. They don't have any context of the world and how gross that is, okay? So, and then number five is stop with the mini therapy sessions. It's just, that was invented for the mom, not the toddler. You know, discussing all their big feelings and big emotions. Toddlers are all about actions. But these mini therapy sessions are really, they're just tanking. They're just awful. Okay. My three-year-old boy is scared of hand washing, screaming, scratching, and crying. What to do? I have no idea what's going on there. When did that start? Uh, is it in all bathrooms? Is it the hot water, the cold water? Was he ever burnt? Does he have allergies? Does he break out in a rash? Um, does he not like the water going down his arms? That could be it too, because they're off like that. That could be it. So I don't know what it is. I'd have to figure that out. Maybe try those wrist things. They're called wrist scrunchies so that the water doesn't run down his arms, because I know some kids hate that. I don't know what the reason is, so I don't know how to help you with that. If you want my help, you could hire me for coaching. But otherwise, I've just thrown out a few ideas. No, I only threw out one idea. <laughs> okay. How to get a one-year-old to sleep in a cot. I don't know what you mean by that. Well, in Australia, I raised my kids in Australia. A cot is a crib. So how to get a one-year-old to sleep in a cot. So where are they sleeping now with you? You're co-sleeping with them or are they in a bassinet? Just throw them in there. Not throw them, but you know what I mean. Put them in there and have something new and exciting that they can look at. Like have... Um, that galaxy light or something. So make it exciting. Make this an, an exciting transition. Uh, children have problems. Sorry, I got traffic. Children have problems with transitions. We all do. We all like to go. We all like to lean towards the comfortable. Trying something new can be exciting, but also scary. So try and make it more fun. A seven-year-old grandson who fights doing homework. It's exhausting. Well, that's usually quite easy with a seven-year-old. You can just say, uh, do homework within one hour of being asked to do so. So make sure that's very, very clear. And then you're going to check it afterwards. And if they don't do it, there's a consequence, period. There's a consequence. Maybe do it with them. Sit with them and do it too. Um, but yeah, there's a consequence if they don't. Seven years old, they can understand that. So yeah, there, it would be, I would use the as soon as method. Sure, you can play video games as soon as you've done your homework, as soon as. That's why I never told my kids what to do. If, they would never have asked me to do something if they knew there was something that they had to do. I, that I taught them from a very young age. You got to do what you need to do before you can do what you want to do. You got to earn the wants. I don't just hand them out. Sure, you can play video games as soon as you've made your bed. Oh, okay. And they run and do it. No big deal, right? So they got to the point they knew they would never ask to do anything unless they knew that the needs were fulfilled. They did what they needed to do first. So at seven, they can learn that. 
I try to speak in low voice, but I lose it in the end with seven-year-old girl. Yeah, you just haven't got all the leadership stuff figured out yet. That's all. Parents who, like when I'm coaching one-on-one -on -one parents, um, when they get it, they get it. And they go, oh, I see, it works. So they're willing to put in the work and go through the short-term pain to get to the long-term gain. Once they start to see glimmers of that long-term gain, the short-term stuff gets easy. So losing it, they just don't do it anymore. It's amazing how they just don't do it anymore. Once they set themselves, start to see the results of this leadership stuff, they stop yelling. They stop losing it. They just get ultra calm. It's quite, it's quite fascinating to see. Um, they actually say it helps with a lot of other people's skills too, because the the more angry someone gets, like I, I don't have anyone in my life these days at all who is the least bit negative. I like positive people, and I'm old enough you can call people out of your life that are that are negative. <laughs> but I've had lots of, you know, I've had lots of people I've had to deal with in life that were snarky and you know, nasty or whatever. So I've had that. So it's a matter of learning how to deal with that. It's not a matter of sort of eliminating that when you're younger and kids can't do that. So they have to teach some people skills. Um, but yeah, it's tough. I, I was, who was I talking to? Yet? Oh no, I can't talk about it. Never mind. It, it was too, uh, it was too obvious. Like I, I don't know how to explain it, but if anyone that knew that person heard this, they would know exactly who I'm talking about. So I keep it all very, um, you know, I don't like my clients to be exposed. Should I be worried my sons are constantly arguing with each other? Should you be worried? No, but it's annoying, right? So I don't know the age. I Did I? Just a sec. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Oh, okay. Today I'm doing my video today. I've got three of them coming out every day lately. Today I've got a video, a video coming out, how to help my kids stop fighting. So look out for that. It'll be coming out later on today. It might be later on tonight. So I never know. How do you deal with tantrums in public places? The exact same I deal with them at home. Like I'm the same mother everywhere I go. But in public, I make sure that it's not somewhere where it's disturbing people. Like if they're screaming, I don't ignore a tantrum if they're screaming in church or in a restaurant or somewhere where it's quiet and it's disturbing people. I would drag them out to the car or into the parking lot, wherever, and then ignore them there. Um, and you still don't look at them or talk to them when you're taking them out of there. But yeah, I, I'm the exact same mother everywhere I go. If you're allowing your embarrassment in public to affect your parenting, um, I can't help you. Like what I mean is you can't do that because you have to be consistent. If your kids learn that you're a different parent and they can get away with anything when you're out in public, you're not a leader and they pick up on that very quickly. It's funny because kids are very quick to pick up on what you do wrong and not what you do right. You remember everything you've ever done wrong in your whole life or their whole life, but then the good stuff. And my, my son used to say, remember the time you did that, mom, and the time you did? And I said, what about all the good stuff I did? And he'd say, what? <laughs> he just loved to see me go, yeah, I remember that. Oh, that was awkward. What about all the good stuff? Huh? Well, he's expecting a little girl soon. So uh, I can't wait to sit back and watch him parent. None of my business. <laughs> he used to say when he was younger, he was going to try and parent the way I did. But now I think he sort of realizes he'll probably be, give in more. Um, especially now that he's having a little girl. Okay. My three-year-old doesn't want to share and easily gets frustrated what to do. So when things don't go their way, so when it's not all about them, the sooner you teach them that, the better. So just put down, um, you can't put share, it's too general. Um, but yeah, I don't know the situation, but there's usually something that you can pick. Just pick one specific non-sharing, frequently happening incident and put that on the behavior board. And say, you must share with this and, th and be very explicit on how sharing is done. A lot of kids don't share because they haven't been taught how to do it. So, yeah. Like we're very quick to, um, oh, I lost my train of thought. I'm going through a detox. I got off diet Pepsi. This is day six. Oh, my brain has just been fried. I get like real, ugh. anyway, it's a real thing. Uh, detoxing from diet Pepsi. It's the caffeine and the aspartame put together. It's double whammo. So yeah, I'm not doing too well these days. Anyway, what the heck was I saying? Um, uh, bu, 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 bu. Yeah, that's so true. Perfect memory when it comes to times to point out hypocrisy. <laughs> uh, 
what the heck? I started to answer something, then I completely lost my train of thought. Oh yeah, parents are very quick to focus on what kids are doing wrong, but then they forget to focus on teaching them how to do it right. You gotta guide them along. That's what a leader does. You show them how to do it the right way. It would be like being hired by someone with no guidance, no operations manual, and then when you mess up, they criticize you for it. it doesn't make any sense. I was very good at setting up systems and expectations for my kids and just, set, and it was negotiable as they got older, especially. Um, then they'd say, well, look, I, I think that bedtime's unfair. I'm getting older. I'd say, sure, okay, let's make it an hour later. You know, it was all negotiable as they got older. But I was very clear of what my expectations of them were. And also I was very, uh, very quick to be accountable myself because I was showing them the way. I'm showing them it's okay to make mistakes. Oh, that was what I wanted to do. Mistakes are opportunities to learn. That was, I'm going to be doing that video tomorrow. Uh, mistakes are opportunities to learn. They're not something that you should feel bad about. Um, so like if my kids messed up, I'd say, well, that was stupid. Oh, well, we all do stupid things sometimes. Big deal. So, you know, what do you think the consequence should be? So it's not that there's no consequence for maybe doing something wrong or that you kind of know is bad. Um, but it's just make sure it's when it gets repetitive and they're rude about it. And, you know, um, then it becomes a problem. It's okay to, it's okay to make mistakes. Nothing wrong with that. You don't want to, you don't want to drill your kids into the ground just because they're making mistakes. Um, and be careful with that. There's a fine line there. Anyway. Uh, my daughter laughs when I discipline. She's impossible to teach. I hear that all the time. It's usually with younger children. Um, but yeah, they're not laughing. They're mocking. They're, it's a bit different. Uh, laughter is like when you actually find joy. <laughs> There's no joy in that, by the way, for your child. They may look like it. It's more of a hey, 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 like that kind of stuff. Anyway, I don't know what's going on, but guaranteed you're not a leader. They don't do that if you're a leader. So um, yeah, uh, work on your leadership skills. Remember, we're never fixing kids. We're fixing and teaching parents here. I teach parenting, not kidding. They already know how to be kids. By the way, all of their behavior is a direct result of your parenting. So you lead, they will follow. It's just a natural instinct for children to follow a really good leader. It's just a natural instinct. So, and they will, they all will. I've never worked with a kid who didn't. I've never worked with a kid I couldn't get respect with. Teenagers at any age. Um, so yeah, you lead, they will follow. So that's all that tells me. She's laughing at you because you're not a leader. Work on your leadership skills. Remember, it's not her fault. She's reacting to your parenting. So, and that's good news because that means you have control. You broke it, you can fix it, right? That's a good thing. Take full responsibility. Always amazes me when parents want to blame their kids for everything. But she's so difficult. And I'm like, mm, I've worked with hundreds of kids. And if they act out when they're with me, I'm always like this. What am I missing here? What am I doing wrong? I always look to myself because I'm a leader. So a leader always blames themselves and take full responsibility for a child's actions. So that's what I'm always encouraging parents to do. Until you do, I really can't help you. Like if you think it's their fault that they're acting out, then I can't help you. Once you understand it's you, then, yeah, we can get to work. Lisa, I can't ever imagine you having a lazy day. Oh, my God. What a funny time to say that. Yesterday, I'm because I am detoxing from, um, I actually thought, am I dying? What's going on here? Yesterday, I laid on the couch. I tried to get some work done on my computer, but I kept nodding off from 10 in the morning till six at night. I could get up for sessions. And when I absolutely had to, I was not feeling well at all. I thought, what's wrong with me? And it's, I'm sure it's the detoxing. And um, yeah, anyway, it is a real thing, detoxing from the withdrawal symptoms, detoxing from diet coke because it's caffeine and aspartame. And I was drinking gallons of the stuff and I knew I was doing, I knew I shouldn't have been doing that. But anyway, I had a really bad day last Friday. My heart rate just went crazy. It was scared the bejeebies out of me. That's why I quit it. And I mean, just started racing. It was at the gym and I don't, I'm quite fit, but it just went up and I was just sitting there. Like I hadn't even done anything yet. Scared the bejeebies out of me. So anyway, yeah, yesterday was a bad day. Today I'm better. Who knows? But yeah, if you look it up, detoxing from caffeine takes two to nine days. Detoxing from aspartame takes 14 to 30 days. <laughs> I didn't know that. Uh, anyway, so yeah, yesterday was a write-up. I had to do what I had to do, but that's all I did. I was horizontal pretty much all day. 
How do I respond to a tantrum? Hello, you must be new here. I talk about this a lot. Actually, not many people ask me about tantrums anymore because I go on about it so much. Oh, I was going to read how you deal with it. I don't know why. I mean, <laughs> anyway, you completely ignore tantrums completely, but you're there. You're, you, you want them to see you ignoring it. You want them to see you. It's like you're waiting, like you're just filing your nails, waiting for them to finish. You ignore the crazy, reward the calm. As soon as they're done, oh, you're all done? You want to go to the park? Like you just ignore that. That is their own brain processing, not getting what they want, when they want, and how they want it. If you interfere that process of them learning how to, from the beginning to the middle to the end, how to process not getting their own way, if you interfere in that, it's going to take longer for them to figure it out. It's going to take longer for their brain to build that pathway to self-regulate. You cannot teach a child to self-regulate. That is absolute garbage. It is the stupidest thing I ever heard. What do you do? Open their skull up and twist a dial? It's ludicrous. Ludicrous. Oh, God, I get hyped up. Why do I get so worked up over that? It drives me nuts that it drives me so nuts. But anyway, it just does. It's about because I, I get so much kickback over that. That's how I grew my channel. I started talking about ignoring tantrums and my channel just blew up overnight because it, it made sense to people, right? But anyways, ignoring tantrums decreases duration, intensity, and frequency. It just does. And it also sets you up as a leader. I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, which one should I tell? I will tell the swing story. It's about, this is the best way I can explain why you should ignore tantrums. Okay, so my son was two years old. I went, took him to the park. It was just me and a two-year-old boy, my son. And another mom was there with her, two, her two-year-old boy. I sort of seen her around. She was new to the neighborhood. So I live downtown, siren. Anyway, some people say they can't even hear it. That's only me, because it the sound thing. Oh, come on, go. <laughs> Uh, go to your fancy fire. Anyway, that was from Seinfeld. So anyway, um, tantrum. Oh yeah, I'll tell the swing story. So I go to the park and there's this other mom there. I'd seen her around, but I didn't know her. So we're introducing ourselves as we're putting our boys in the swings, two two-year-old boys. And they both pointed to the other swing. Oh, kids are nuts, right? So um, we both said, well, let's just switch the swing. Who cares, right? We're chatting away, trying to chat, right? They both start having a tantrum at the exact same time both of them. There were two benches. She took her son over to one bench. I took my son over to, to another bench. Here's how my bench went. My son started to run back towards the swing. I just put my arm out, didn't talk to him, put my arm out. He knew me. He knew. He only lasted about two minutes with the tantrum. He just sat there and, and screamed for a minute, about two minutes. Anyway, he was finished. And then I said, and I'm completely ignoring him. I just put my arm out because you can physically restrain them if you, if you don't like what they're going to do. So I put my arm up and then I'm complete. I'm looking at the trees. No way would I look at him or talk to him. No, I'm not going to interfere that process. He has to build a blueprint for how to, do, how to handle not getting his own way. Anyway, and he already had beeps too. He was already figuring it out. So anyway, two minutes later, he's finished having the tantrum. And I said, oh, y'all done? Okay, let's go back on the swing. He's swinging, having a great time. Anyway, here's the other bench. This mom is talking to him, trying to hug him. Let's talk about your feelings. You know you shouldn't have done that. This kid is escalating like you wouldn't believe. Getting worse and worse, just hysterical. The mom was getting upset, and I'm watching it all like, what a train wreck. Anyway, so finally, 20 minutes later, he started getting the hiccup cries. <laughs> you know that. So he's finished with the tantrum. Do you know what she did? Instead of saying, oh, y'all done, let's go on the swing. Instead of rewarding him for calming down, for going through all that hell that she had dragged out by, by talking to him him and interrupting his process you know oh I'm so stupid anyway she didn't know any better but god it was frustrating to watch and then then she starts talking about everything he did wrong for another 10 minutes 20 minutes of a tantrum that she's interrupting constantly that making worse and worse and worse attention feeds a tantrum so she was feeding it feeding it feeding it this kid was absolutely distraught and then when he calmed down well he's still crying but he caught he didn't have a tantrum and she discusses everything you did wrong. Well, you know, if you just asked nicely to go on the other side, you didn't have to have a tantrum. You know, your big feelings. Oh my God, this poor kid. Just absolutely. She just didn't know what she was doing. I felt, and I don't tell other people what to do. You're here soliciting my advice, but it's none of my business. Right? So anyway, then finally, I guess they went on the swing, but my kid was tired and wanted to go home at that point. Now, which would you rather experience? Which do you think is the better option? Dragging that poor kid through the mud by, cons by constantly interfering in that tantrum process? And not even rewarding him after it was over. Like she just gave him a mini therapy session afterwards. What a mean thing to do. I get She didn't mean it that way, but she didn't understand how mean that is. And my kid was happily swinging for all that time, having a great time. He knew me. He knew that the sooner I shut up and finish this tantrum, the quicker I'm going to get back on that swing.
He knew that. And he was never going to get any attention during a tantrum. I could not. It's like I didn't even know he was there. <laughs> I'm looking around. Now, do you see? That kind of explains it the best way I know how. The funny thing is that people think, well, you're ignoring their feelings. No, that happens organically. Tantrums are not feelings. They're a total loss of emotional control. They just lose their nut. It's not feelings, okay? Plus, what are his feelings? Which kid was getting their feelings met? Which kid do you think had happier feelings, felt better about himself, felt better about his mother? Which kid do you think overall was happier? Which one's more healthy mentally, right? Does it make sense? Anyway, you're brand new. That's why you got the whole spiel. I don't usually talk about tantrums on here anymore because everyone's sick of me raving on about it. But anyway, it's like time out. Time out and tantrums. You talk about either one of those and <laughs> I'll just never shut up. Uh, the cortisol levels for extended period. Okay. For extended periods of tantruming like that is not good for kids. Um, you mean the one where she was feeding the tantrum? Uh, yeah, I, I can't comment on that. I'm sure it's not good for them. They survive, though. You know, I think you're just sort of, you know, I, I, I wouldn't get into that. I wouldn't worry about that. I just want, all I focus on is happy and healthy kids. Are they happy and healthy? My kid was happy and healthy, and her kid was anything but. <laughs> oh, my God. It was all, it was agony to watch because I knew everything she was doing wrong. I know. And it's trendy right now. I get it. It's the mini therapy sessions. It's the please your parent style that's so trendy right now. That's what she was doing. Um, I get it. She was being led astray and she followed, she followed it. She ate, she drank the Kool-Aid. Yeah, it was, it was hard to watch. Three-year-old gagging when seeing other people eat doesn't like to try new food. Well, okay. Um, I'm going to say that's manipulation. That's my gut reaction. I could be wrong. I'm going to say that's a play for attention, manipulative. I could be wrong. If you're really concerned, it could be some other condition and go see a pediatrician. But I've known kids who've done that, and it's just been to get their own way. Um, it gets attention. I got a gift card at the doctor for not being a pleaser parent. What? What's that? What do you mean? I don't know what you mean by that. Okay, two-year-old hitting and throwing. I put in the crib for timeout, but it doesn't work. I hate timeout. I can't stand timeout. Imagine if you made a mistake at work and your boss said, you go sit in the corner for an hour. Like it's humiliating. That's how kids feel. I think it's mean and humiliating and it does nothing. I can't stand time out. So yeah, just get rid of it. Um, and to under three years old, that's a toddler under the age of three. But at three years old, my behavior board kicks in. That's when you can start using it. Under that, you can't. Because they have to be able to stop and think before they act, before the behavior board works. Uh, but under that, they're consistent corrective actions in the moment, right then and there, every single time. That's how they learn. So yeah, if they do something you don't like, consistent corrective action, right in the moment. They learn through repetition, but it has to be right in the moment. Is there a, any situation, oh, such a good question. Is there any situation you would say yes to having a conversation about how to handle their feelings? Only when things are calm. And even then, I said to my son once, I think he was, I don't know, four or five, and I said, you know, it's okay to get angry. They learn this organically, though. They learn things, oh, shoot, what was it? Someone was talking about how kids learn. And God, I wrote it down, and I don't have it anymore. Shoot. Shoot, that was such a good way of explaining because I get that's exactly what I'm always trying to tell people is how kids learn. They learn about feelings and emotions organically. If you provide a happy home life and, and you're a good leader and you deal with bad behavior, their feelings are all regulated. They tend to be calmer. They're not highly sensitive. They have confidence. So their feelings are sort of taken care of. My kids told me everything. They write through the teen years. You're a safe place to land. As a leader, that is the bonus to all this. When you become really good at leadership, you are a safe place to land. They'll tell you anything. So, yeah, if I see that a kid's upset about something, I'd say, okay, what's going on here? Want to talk about it? And then I might take a guess, and then you, you leave the door open, 
And there's all sorts of other methods that I use with all that too, by the way, getting information out of kids. I got a lot of tips and tricks for that. But anyway, uh, but yeah. And if they're really upset about something, of course I'd say, but never in the moment when they're angry, never, 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 never. What's the point? Uh, But later on I say, you know, you're really upset. But anyway, I said to my son, that's right. I said to my son, he used to have tantrums. And I said to him, there's nothing wrong with being mad. Nothing wrong with it. But don't drag us, don't drag us all through the mud. Just go in your room and scream into a pillow. I think he did it once and then he never had tantrums again. Like he just sort of lost interest because he was raised with a leader in the house. They don't tend to act out past a certain age. They just don't. So the feelings are taken care of organically when you're a leader. They know you. They know they can talk to you about anything. You're a really good, safe place to land. Plus, I was very open with my kids. I discussed everything um, age appropriate. So they never really, nothing was ever a closed topic with my kids, ever, ever, ever. And I always used to say things like this. If you ever think you're gay or in the wrong body or something, you come and tell me. We'll work that out together, okay? We'll figure it all out. So I was always making sure that they knew I was there, and they did. But the thing is that when you're a good leader, they don't, their, their emotions tend to be very regulated. They feel very safe. Um, so that's, that's what I found anyway. But yeah, a leader is a very safe place to land. They'll tell you everything. But what you're talking about is the mini therapy sessions. And um, I haven't found children need that. The only time that I do that, they don't tend to need many therapy sessions. You know, children learn more about life through fun than anything else. Shoot. What was that guy? It was a Dr. Huberman. You know, the doctor, Dr. Huberman, he's all over um, YouTube and everywhere. Anyway, it was him. He said how children learn. And I, God, I wish I'd written down the way he'd worded it because I'm not educated with all this. He is. He, and he worded it so beautifully. He says, children don't basically children don't learn through therapy sessions was basically what he was saying. They learn organically. They learn through fun. They learn all about feelings through fun and enjoyment and happiness. That's where they learn their most effective learning takes place. Uh, but yeah, God, I wish I could remember that. Why would I have not looked, read that down? Uh, why well, I did write it down. Why would I have got rid of that? Boy, I'm mad at myself. Yeah, I did. I got rid of it. Anyway, I do my hour of learning every morning. That's part of my morning routine. I just watch all these smart people and I learn from them. And then I make notes. And then I usually go back and and I have another place I put the really important notes and I forgot to put that there. By the way, if you become really good at handling their behavior, they become really good at handling their feelings. As I said, it becomes organic. It's organic. It just happens when you're a leader. Oh, I'll give you a really good example of this. Um, Potty training. I have a course on that if you're interested. Um, Let's say they have a mess. Now, this is such a good example of this, and it's kind of weird. But it's just a perfect example of why I don't discuss feelings with toddlers. Now, if a toddler messes on the floor, because you don't put pull-ups or anything on when you're potty training. I do it like just immersion, full immersion, no night diapers, nothing. I have a whole system on how you do it. Anyway, um, if they go on the floor, this is what I know other moms want to say. Well, that's okay. You can do that. That's fine. We'll just clean it up. And all these mini therapies, that kind of mini therapy session stuff, I don't talk like that. If a toddler messes on the floor, this is what I say. Oh, well, mommy does it too sometimes. I'll clean it all up. Like you don't get them to clean it up. You do it. So we'll clean it all up and they're all happy. That that instills a greater sense of confidence and no shame than discussing it. It just does. Oh, well, mommy sometimes pees on the floor too. No big deal. And then they laugh and it's all good. You see? They learn through fun. They learn through humor. Um, does that make sense? It's really convoluted. I'm not good at explaining that. I feel like I'm losing myself here. Anyway, uh, I know exactly what I'm thinking. I just can't get it out because I'm going through my withdrawal symptoms on my drug. My drug of choice was Diet Pepsi, and I've gone off it now. Day six, I'm a mess. I'm a mess. Overtalking seems to go with overthinking. Let it go. Yeah, yeah. Like, don't go on about it. It's going on about, and the, where you put your focus, like all the problems, is what grows. Put your focus and your energy into what you want. You want happy kids, right? You don't want kids who are in therapy 
discussing all their feelings, that grows. It grows and grows and grows. Um, but my kids told me everything. They came, they came to me with everything. They didn't know how not to talk to me. My mom was like that. I, I got that. My mom was a really good listener. And I got that from my mom. How to deal with a toddler when he's insisting on something that's not time for. Uh, let's say they're two years old. Um, they want to have um, lunch. Uh, well, would it be lunch or something fun? I don't know. Just say, yeah, we're getting it ready now. And then just to, then try and divert their attention to something else. You divert your conversation to something else. Yeah. Oh, did you play with the ball the other day? And they might still be crying in that. And then if they start crying, then I'd look away while I'm making lunch. Like you look like you're just, you're just going about your business. Don't get pulled into discussing all this stuff with them. It's over discussing everything, over explaining yourself. It makes you look weak. It makes you look like you don't know what you're doing. Think about it this way, like a teacher, um, they're teaching something and the kids, but I'm tired. Would she stop and discuss how tired they are or just keep teaching? You know, like you're, you're in charge, you're the leader, you know, and we'll, yeah, we'll go for lunch at, at 12. Uh, but I'm tired now. I'm tired now. I said, we'll go at 12. And then she just keeps teaching. It's like that. Take control. Take control. What? Are three-year-olds supposed to still be loud and busy? According to my boy's play center, they're not. <laughs> Is the play center run by inexperienced teenagers? Like, <laughs> so in other words, yeah, I think they're still supposed to be loud and busy, especially when they all get together at a play center. Oh my God. I'm like that. If I go somewhere fun, I'm loud and busy. Okay. If your daughter is hitting at school, I don't know how old she is, by the way. Um, she, you said they don't do it at home. Well, they don't do it at home because you're probably not taking the toys that they want, right? They're probably trying to get what they want. They don't want anything you've got. They don't want the dishwasher. They don't want the, the washing machine. So that's generally why they would do that. But if she's three and above, I would put no hitting. And I would say no hitting at daycare specifically. You're trying to correct that. And then say, I'll be asking the teacher and they'll be telling me if you hit. And if you do, you're going to have to bring one of your favorite toys to that child to play for them to play with at home for the whole weekend. Something like that. Get creative with it. Um, but yeah, I would deal with that. I don't like hitting. Like I don't like, that's not something I would just let go. That's the first thing I deal with. If kids are violent or aggressive towards anyone, uh, that's the first thing I deal with. Except with teenagers. Um, teenagers, they're my specialty. I, I, they're my favorite age. Um, that's how I built my business really was working with uh, teen crisis work, but if they're hitting and violent, you do not address that in the first session. That's maybe the third session. You got to work on connecting and bonding with them first. Then you can start addressing things. But um, your drug of choice is coffee. Yeah, I think my problem with this withdrawal symptoms is the aspartame. The, the caffeine, I felt like in the first three or four days, I was okay with that. But the aspartame, it's a whole different thing. I did a lot of research on it because I thought, am I dying? <laughs> you know, I, okay, I'm a little bit dramatic. I was laying on the couch trying to work. Uh, am I dying? I just felt so weak. So, yeah, drama queen. <laughs> oh, God, I, I should get my affairs in order. Like, you just start to think the craziest stuff. I just felt like I was in another dimension. I was so out to lunch. I'm better today. I've set my day up a little bit differently today. So I can't possibly, I've had to be busy, whatever. <sighs> okay. How would you recommend handling the violence in a daycare center as a teacher to two-year-olds? I don't teach teaching. That is not my lane at all. I stay in my lane. My lane is parent-child relationships. That's it. Um, I do not, just a huge portion of my clients, daycare workers, teachers, principals, child psychologists, um, huge portion of them because they're learners too, right? So, and the parenting is different from anything else. So I don't profess to be an expert in any of that. And I, I would, for me to give advice for a daycare center, I have a lot of ideas about it, but I would never give you advice because I don't know enough. I feel like I know a lot about parenting all ages. That's my thing. 
but I don't know. I don't know enough about, I'm not an expert at daycare or teaching or anything. I, I know a lot. I've spent a lot of time in those places volunteering and helping out teachers and that, but I, I'm not qualified in my mind to give advice. I feel very qualified to give parenting advice because I feel like I know a lot about it, but yeah, I don't know enough about daycare. What if I told you something and it was wrong? What if it was illegal? Like uh, hugging kids. I'm very demonstrative with kids because I teach parenting. So you're allowed to hug your own kids. But some, you know, what if I told teachers to, oh, make sure you give them a hug. Well, that's illegal. So <laughs> see what I'm saying? Yeah, I stay out of that. You know, I've never been hired by um, a youth worker. A youth worker works with troubled teens. Now, if you can get respect with troubled teenagers, you don't need my help. They're the PhD in all this. That's my specialty is troubled teens. They're, that's the PhD in all this because they are so manipulative, so clever, so sly, um, so challenging that when you understand it's not about being smarter than them, it's about being vulnerable and humble. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a whole other thing. And so, yeah, I've never been hired by a youth worker. Their people skills are, are pretty fine-tuned out of necessity. Two-year-old hitting. I have a whole course on that if you're interested. That's in the link above, and it's, I can't remember what it's called. I did change the name of it. I didn't do it. Someone else did. But anyway, the name is different. It's a better name. What's it called now? I'm just looking it up. It's up on the link above there. All my, everything I've got to offer, it, it's on my website, is all in bullet point form in that link. Uh, Oh, Toddlers Hitting and Biting, one to three-year-olds. Oh, it's still not a flashy title, but what else can you call that, right? Toddlers Hitting and Biting. I think I call it Toddlers Who Sometimes Hit and Bite and Sleep. <laughs> oh, God. Can't wait to get scheduled with you. Okay, let me call you. Well, i got to write that down. Have you, you already hired me, and that name's familiar. I'll just make sure I've done everything on my part. And if I didn't, if I messed up and you never heard from me after you've paid for coaching, I always hand out a free session. I have to do that uh, not very often anymore, but usually once a year that happens where I mess up. Oh, and it just makes me feel not, I literally feel like I'm going to throw up. If I've met, they say, I hired you, I paid for coaching and you never got back to me. I literally feel like I'm going to throw up. <laughs> it makes me sick. <laughs> so I'm going to check into that to make sure I've done everything on my part. And I'm just waiting for you if you've hired me. Okay. Son is eight and he will talk over me or walk away when I'm trying to have a serious come. Why are you trying to have a serious conversation with him? What's that all about? Um, so in other words, you're trying to um, tell him what he's doing wrong and he gets up and walks away. I'd probably do that too. See, I don't do that. Um, yeah, I just don't do that stuff. That's the therapy session stuff. I don't do that. There's no point. They already know uh, when they've done something wrong. So I'm guessing that's why he's getting up and walking away because he doesn't respect you. They don't tend to respect uh, people who give them therapy sessions. They just don't. Um, what's a good example? Oh, the pool story is a really good example of that one. Why you don't discuss what they're having a serious conversation with a kid. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Haley. Yeah, she doesn't teach daycare workers, only parents. I stay in my lane. I'm very confident with parenting. This is my thing. I've been, for 51 years, I've been studying kids and figuring out how to mentor them and work and volunteer with them. And I always mothered them. So it was always sort of a motherly role. And then when I had my own kids, you got to learn how, you got to learn how to deal with your own kids too. You got to learn how to live with teenagers and raise them right into adulthood before you can teach this stuff. Because it's all experience-based. That's why so many of my clients are principals, teachers, child psychologists, because they may have all the degrees, but parenting is experience-based. Like, I couldn't do what they do at all. What's your biggest advice for parents is become a really good listener. Uh, listen to understand and show empathy. You don't listen to gather information to lecture with. Become a really good listener. That is one skill that will take you right through the teen, young adult age. They'll tell you everything. Um, yeah, listen. Uh, listen to understand and show empathy. Do not listen to gather information to lecture with. They'll shut you up. By the time they're teenagers, they're not going to tell you anything. It would be like with friends. If they tell you what's going, oh, my God, he, uh, he did this. And then, you know, uh, well, this when I was younger, we used to talk about that. But anyway, and then, and then he hurt my feeling. And then, okay, here's what you do. Would, would that friend want to talk to you after that? No, they want a shoulder to cry on. They want somebody. It's okay. You're great. He's a jerk. You're wonderful. That's what they want. 
They don't want, here's what you should have done. You know what you did wrong? You know what you did wrong? It was, <laughs> you used the wrong deodorant. You didn't brush your teeth. Enough. Like, you know what I mean? Like the, people don't want to hear that. Adults don't and kids certainly don't. So think about that. Okay, we have a family emergency, and now we have my nine-year-old uh, niece. Now we have my niece. No, anyway, okay, that's coaching. I can't help. That's a coaching issue. I deal with kids in crisis, so um, that would be you know, coaching. If you want my help, you'd have to hire me for that. That's all in the link above there. Toddler's screaming, and the laughs at me when I tell him to stop and continues to scream. Yeah, they're going to do that. Toddlers are crazy. Just don't let it get under your skin. I just take action. Toddlers are all about consistent corrective actions. If you're trying to talk to him about stopping something, good luck with that. Toddlers are not about words. That's not their language. That's for you, not for him or, or her. That's for you. Um, can a baby be born healthy at 33 weeks? I'm not a doctor. I would never answer that. I, would, I don't have a clue. I don't even know how long pregnancies last. I, it's one of those things. I never know how long a pregnancy lasts. I think it's 40 weeks. Is it 40 weeks? I don't know. It's one of those things that, that, you know, just certain things in life you think you'd know. Uh, but I always forget that. Correct. 40 weeks. Yeah. My son was born on his due date. My mom was flying. I lived in Australia. My mom was flying out um, from Canada. And I, she says, what day should I arrive? Because she didn't want to arrive when I was in the hospital. Sure enough, my son was born. 5% of babies at the time, anyway, 33 years ago, are born on their due date. And he was born on his due date. So my mom, we had to get someone else to pick my mom up from the hospital. <laughs> You know, wouldn't you know, my daughter was born two days early. My 15 month old has tantrums that I can't seem to calm. Well, you can't, you can't calm tantrums. She calms down while alone. Is this okay? I don't know if you're putting her in another room. She, they, they only usually tantrum to get attention. So if they're not around you, then they, they often will stop having a tantrum. But I would rather be near them, and I'd like them to see me filing my nails and just waiting. So in other words, I'm not giving that any attention. That will never get attention from me, ever. That's why kids just don't tend to tantrum around me, because they learn pretty quickly that that's not going to get them what they want, which is attention. So, um, but yeah, you know what, though? If it's working, don't fix it. If it's working, yeah, don't fix what isn't broken if it's working. Because it's not one of those things that's horrible. Sometimes horrible stuff, like yelling, you want to fix that. It's working now, but it'll backfire down the road. But yeah, it, don't worry about that. And if it's working, who am I to judge that, right? It's not what I would do, but also my way works really well. It's a whole package, everything. I know exactly what I'm doing. I've got it all figured out over all 51 years of working with kids. Um, but it's not the only way. I'm sure there's other ways that work too. I'm not stupid. You know, I know that there's, <laughs> I'm not that egotistical that I think my way is the only way. It's ridiculous. I'm sure there's lots of other, what would you do with a public tantrum? The exact same thing. Uh, if it's somewhere where it's going to be disturbing other people, like in church or a restaurant, then I would take them out to the parking lot or in the car and let them tantrum there while I ignore them. And even when I'm taking them out, I'm not looking at them or talking to them. I'm just physically moving them. Um, but yeah, I don't give the tantrums any attention. Um, and plus, if you're a different parent when you're out, your kids are not going to respect you when you're home either. you got to be 100%. I was 100% predictable. That's why my kids would never have pushed me or asked me for something if they knew the answer was no. Why would they? I was. If they'd asked me for something that they knew the answer was no, I would have gone like this. Are you kidding me? What? What are you talking about? Like, <laughs> why would you ask that? No, that's not true. What I would have said as they got older is, of course we're going to do that. And they would have said, never mind. Like I would have used sarcasm. <laughs> I would have thought that was funny. Um, uh, a good example of that was uh, I was the, the leader. Their dad was the pleaser parent. And it's usually the way it goes. There's usually a leader and a pleaser. There's never an authority and a, and a leader. They don't, they're like oil and vinegar, oil and water. They don't mix. Uh, but you can have an authority and a pleaser, and you can have a leader and a pleaser. Anyway, and that's usually the way it goes. There's usually only one leader and one pleaser. He was the treat master. He was the one that took them up for ice cream and all that sort of stuff. And I just didn't, because I figured I wanted to give him something. Like, that was his role. And he was, very, you know, he was a great dad, but he was more the pleaser. But he always backed me up. But I remember, I think it was one time, one of my kids said, Mom, can we go up for ice cream? And I looked at them like, 
like that's your dad's role. Like I was so confused because I'm really into healthy food. So, but yeah, that was their dad's role. He was out of town. So I don't, might have taken them out for that. But I was just so confused why they would ask me for that because they knew I would have said no. And I talked tough, but their dad, was, I think, was out of town. That's why they asked. I probably did. Never mind. I'm not admitting that. Yeah, I probably did. Okay. Oh, my God, I need help. I have a boy turning four in October who listens to nothing. That's because you're not saying the right things. You're not doing the right things. Remember, their behavior is 100% a direct result of your parenting. So you just got to work on your parenting skills and your leadership skills. Kids are, they're, they're born with a certain nature and a certain personality, but their behavior is 100% a direct result of your parenting. So set yourself up as a leader. That's all I teach here. I've got co courses up above. You can hire me for coaching and my free behavior boards there. Um, so yeah, just check all that out. Set yourself up as a leader and then they will listen. It's never the kids. I work with hundreds of kids and troubled teenagers. I've never had problems getting respect. I don't even talk about this once. There was one girl, but she ended up institutionalized. A poor little thing. She was the cutest little thing. Tiny too. She was very young. She scared the hell out of me. I knew there was something. She was wired wrong. And that was the only kid I could never, ever, ever work with. And um, yeah, she ended up in an institution very young too. Oh, tragic. Eh? Anyway, so I, don't, I shouldn't talk about that. But every time I say I've never had a problem getting respect, I did. But then she, she had a mental illness. Oh, God. Oh, it was tragic. Cute as a button. Anyway, whatever. Do you recommend your services for two-year-olds? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes just one session with a toddler. Depends. How far do you want to go with it? How far do you want to know where you're going to be going? How far do you want to be prepared ahead of time for what's coming down the pike? So lots of parents hire me in prevention. Um, but with toddlers, yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you exactly what to do with toddlers. Um, but it's kind of already all, all on here. But it depends. A lot of it is talking you off the cliff. A lot of coaching is, it's, I'm not a therapist, but a lot of it, my clients say it is. Because they come to me really, really upset. <laughs> so I have to talk them off the cliff. Um, are you a Canadian or American? I thought I saw said U.S. dollars. All of my business stuff is run in Amer in U.S. dollars. I'm Canadian, but my business, all my business expenses, everything is U.S. So I run my business in the U.S. That's how most Canadians tend to do it. Because um, yeah, all the companies that we use and all the people we hire are American. Well, hmm. how do I connect with my 13-year-old in boarding school? I feel like we don't connect as much now. Well, yeah, if, you know, it takes time to connect. It's not quality of time. Everyone says, oh, we always have quality time. Kids don't care about that. It's more about quantity to them. So, yeah, that's a tough one. I would have to work with you and figure out where your relationship's been, where is it now, what's going on, how often do you see them. You'd have to hire me for that. I, I can't answer that. That's not a TikTok answer. Just join. So what does a session include and how can we do it? Can you just do it for general advice? Yeah, you can do it for general advice, but I don't like doing it that way. I like to have a plan. I like to set you up with a plan of action. I like to teach you what to do next, right? So, but sometimes parents, especially child psychologists, they'll actually hire me. Um, well, I probably shouldn't say all this, but um, yeah, they, they often don't want a plan. Um, but yeah, they just want to know why. Because I'm so heavily experience-based, not all child psychologists are, right? Or they haven't worked with everything I've worked with. So they'll come up with maybe someone that they're struggling with, and then they'll hire me. But I like to have a plan. I like to set you up with a plan. Anyway, it's all just one-on-one -on -one Zoom sessions, me and you, no kids, and um, once a week usually. And then when you get on a roll and things are going well, then we'll often peter off and maybe do one session every so often. Or you might just be all done. Sometimes people say, that's it, I get it. And I'm like, you just graduated. So some of them just go off into the sunset and never see me again. Sometimes people hire me year after year because different things come up. Now they're dating. What do we do with that? I found them, some drugs in my son's room. What do I do with that? You know, there's all sorts of stuff that can come up. Two-year-old who constantly says no. So just ignore it. Ireland. I used to think I was Irish. I was told I was half French and half Irish because I'm adopted. And then I did that DNA thing, ancestry thing. Turns out I'm not Irish at all. So I used to celebrate St. Patty's Day. Ah, oh, that'll be the Irish in me. <laughs> Turns out I'm French and Norwegian. I'm not even a half Irish. So I kind of feel like I'm Irish. 
for 55 years. I thought I was half Irish. I'm trying to find your website. I can't find it. It's up in the link above. It's Bratbusters. Just look up Bratbusters. Uh, but it's in, be careful with that, though. Look at the link because I know someone out there, when I went on TikTok, um, I blew up really fast. And then you know what happens when you do that? Other people try and copy you. And some people have been duped out of money thinking it was me and it wasn't. So it's best to go to the link above there. And uh, everything's on there. And my website, if you want to find my website, it's bratbusters.com. Bratbusters.com. But it's bratbusters.com. There's nothing I can do about that. If other people are saying they're me and, you know, and they'll turn up in a coaching session saying that they have a cold and their video isn't working. <laughs> happened it's happened i've had clients come to me later and tell me this isn't that awful us oh, people yeah okay how can ignore toddlers saying no to things she needs to be listening to you're gonna have to give me an example of that um, i only say something once if they don't do it i take action so i never repeat myself uh, i would never do that my son doesn't like to go to school so you got to do what you need to do before you can do what you want to do. Part of needing is school. School prepares you for life, even though you hate it. It's just got to do it. You got you got to learn to embrace what you need to do. It's like chores. It's like anything else that you know. You just it, the sooner they learn, you got to do what you need to do before you can do what you want to do. The better. Both my kids are really hard workers because I I didn't let them off easy. Like if they wanted to do something, I'd say sure. Have you done your chores first? You know, there's always the as soon as method. Sure, you can do that as soon as. So yeah, they just have to learn discipline, that self-discipline. You got to do what you don't want to do sometimes. That's what life, it's good preparation for life. My kids both, especially my son, he questioned me. He says, I'm never going to use this in life. What good is it? And I said, it's just teaching you how to learn. That It's just teaching you self-discipline, how to sit there and be bored out of your mind and not fall asleep. Like that's what school is sometimes, right? Um, I, I do think they should rehash everything about school and prepare them for life. It doesn't teach them uh, a lot of stuff I think would be really really well taught in school. Nothing behavior though. Uh, you know, schools are being expected to parent children these days, which is ridiculous. But I think it'd be better if they taught them things like money management skills. It's up to the parents to do all that sort of stuff. Just basic stuff that isn't taught in school. Instead, we're learning all this stuff we'll never use, but it is teaching you how to learn. So that's the bottom line. Yeah, lots of kids hate school. That's why I don't recommend accelerated learning. Those kids are often bored when they hit school. They've got all those years to go through school. Why would you accelerate their learning? It's a bragging thing for parents. Look what he can do. And I'm like, mm, wow, <laughs> like let them play. Like let them be kids as long as possible. Then they're going to learn through play when they're little anyway. But yeah, financial skills are very important. They need to focus on that. That's why I had to do that with my kids. But I really wish they'd teach them all about compound interest and all that sort of stuff. The real practical day-to-day -day stuff, I wish schools would transfer more into that. I know that a lot of that stuff that parents want them to teach is behavior, which is your job, not school's job. Uh, but yeah, and I don't want the schools to teach them about sex education or anything. I'd rather do that. Um, but uh, I do think that they should teach them more practical financial stuff, how to pay rent, how to manage a bank account. How, you know, I just wish that that was more mandatory. But you know, I'm not going to judge schools because I know how hard it is to change curriculum. And um, but anyway, and how really important our credit is. Yeah, stuff like that. You know, it's just not taught in schools. And that's that's taught. The parents have to teach them that. But schools, it takes a lot to change curriculum. So it takes decades. They're always going to be decades behind. Nonverbal child doesn't respond to anything, even by looking up when calling name. How, well, is that child autistic on the spectrum at all um, or just feisty, just ignoring you? I don't know which one. Um, and autism is not something I discuss on TikTok. That's a coaching issue if you want my help with that. Um, not sure about spectrum yet. Yeah, I, I can't assess that. I'm not qualified for that. Um to teach that, to, to, to assess that. I just asked that because that is an obvious, you would have thought of that, obviously, if they're not responding to you. Um, but yeah. What do you think of homeschooling or unschooling? I don't know what unschooling is. I've heard the term, but I don't really understand it. Uh, different people have said different things. But anyway, homeschool. I have no opinion on that. 
I have none. The only thing I've ever seen that's a problem is when children are teenagers and they're teenagers and they're mainstream, they often struggle socially. And I've talked to lots of people who have said they can spot a homeschooled kid a mile away. They're just different. So most people, and I, I wanted to mainstream my kids. I was pretty hardcore about that. Like my son was labeled gifted when he was young. I kept him mean. He was offered a lot, but I kept him mainstreamed until he hit high school and they had to say, I didn't have a choice. They segregated him, which I was, I thought was a big mistake. I didn't like it. But anyway, anyway, um, that's just my opinion because we're not segregated in life, right? Like I like, you know, I just want you mixed in with everybody. Um, is that in Australia as well? What with the not teaching stuff? Is that what? Is that what you mean? Yeah, my kids were raised in Australia, so. Oh, and with the homeschooling, the way to get around that is if they are, you know, they often are very different from kids who are not homeschooled, is to get them out socializing with other kids who are not homeschooled. The homeschooling community can be wonderful. It's like a church. It's a community, right? And you tend to hang out with other people who homeschool. There's a bit of a danger in that and that the kids aren't used to other kids who are not homeschooled. They tend to be a little bit more savvy about the world in a lot of ways with the social world. They tend to also have a lot more freedom out there in the world. So they're a little bit more savvy um, streetwise. They have more street sense. Um, but anyway, that's, that's the only consistent thing I've ever seen that is pretty consistent with homeschooled kids. But um, I'm not opinionated. It's like religion, homeschooling, religion, co-sleeping, breastfeeding for as long as you want. I, I, ha I have my own personal opinions on it, but I have no advice on those. Those are just my own opinions, which is different from what I teach. I teach what I know works, what I think everyone should be doing with their kids. Uh, this is leadership stuff. But uh, all that stuff is just in a personal choice. Can you help parents in Australia? i got clients all over the world. So, yeah. And I, I do get um, Kiwi and, um, and Aussie clients. And it's funny because I, I, was, I was there for 20 years and I was so assimilated. I had no North American friends. I didn't know anyone North American at all. My husband was Australian. All, everyone I knew was Australian, Kiwi, Palm, um, maybe South African, all English speaking, right? So, um, but yeah, I can't pick an Australian accent because my son's Australian. He's, he moved here when he was 15. So he's very Australian. And I can't hear an Australian accent. So sometimes parents will say, oh, well, is it kind of nice to hear an Australian accent again? And I'll say, oh, I didn't even know you were. Like, I can't pick it. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, deaf to it. Very few of my clients um, are local. They're all from all over the world. Socialization is very important, especially in those teen years. That's when it comes back to them. That's when, you know, you can do anything with your kids. They're kind of in your pockets when they're little, right? They're just, you're their whole world. And then when they're teenagers, if you haven't kind of set them up for that and put them in a whole bunch of situations um, where they have to sort of survive on their own, like I put my kid, I made my kids join stuff. And um, yeah, it makes it harder when they're teenagers. You know, but, but teenage years are going to be tough anyway because you're going through hormones and there's that's a whole lot. You don't want to hear all the teenage stuff. They're my favorite age teenagers. I find them the most interesting because they are. They're fully developed in a lot of ways. Their brain capacity is at their peak. Um, they haven't got the experience yet um, in the frontal lobe, the impulse control. So they haven't got all the experience yet, but their brain power is way stronger than mine is. I'll tell you, mine's half gone now. I'm 62. I'm ha you know, half my brain's all atrophied, I'm sure. But I like the fact that here's what I like about teenagers. If you, if you really listen to them and they look at the world from a very intelligent perspective, but with no baggage, we've got baggage. All of us adults have baggage. We're, we're habitualized in a lot of different ways. They're still open to things. And you'll learn more about the world and yourself from listening to teenagers than almost anything else. That's why I find them so fascinating. But you got to get that relationship where they will talk to you, right? But you want to learn from them. Oh. Uh, oh, sorry, I have to get going. Um, anyway, um, 
I do these lives every day, but the only two times that are ever scheduled are Tuesday nights at 7, Saturday morning at 10 a.m. And that's my time, Pacific time, Vancouver, California, all the West Coast here. And uh, the other times, I never know when I'm going to turn up. So thanks so much for joining me. Go on the link above. There's everything I've got to offer in there. And uh, my courses, my coaching, and my free behavior board. So check that out, and we'll talk again soon. Have a great day. Bye now.